a couple of different things to talk about, some of which are more disappointing than others. Um, so let's get the bad news out of the way. This week, uh, T-Mobile announced that it had been subject to a pretty bad data breach, and this is not a great track record for them. Um, this is their fourth data breach in four years, as far as I'm aware. This time around, 48 million customers were impacted, 7 million prepaid, about 40 million postpaid. Uh, and the way it breaks down is that, to my knowledge, no payment data was leaked. So no credit cards, no uh, bank account numbers, that type of thing. However, a lot of what gets termed as PII, personal identifiable information, names, addresses, dates of birth, uh, potentially social security numbers, was included in this data breach. Now, T-Mobile seems to be responding by trying to give people who it's identified as affected, um, like a free subscription to some McPhee services, McAfee services. Uh, guys, this is your fourth time in four years. I don't think a free service is gonna placate people this time. Something's got to change. Uh, there's some more details in an article Paul wrote about that earlier this week. There'll be a link in the description below. But overall, as a T-Mobile customer, this is actually the first time I've been thinking about leaving the network. I mean, we're, I started as a Sprint customer. I've had my Sprint phone since like 2008 and uh, wasn't too shook up about the acquisition. It went pretty smoothly for me. You know, my phone kept working. I didn't. I lost access to 5G data and kind of irritated about that. But overall, I didn't have 5G service in my area anyway, so it didn't matter. Um, but data breach after data breach after data breach is not confidence inducing. Whether or not the network itself is technically sound, you've got to take care of your customer's information. Um, next up, something that I've unfortunately been taking far too long to do. Uh, the build video for our test bench is live. And for a quick rundown, that is gonna be our brand new SSD and well, any other PCIe device uh, test bench. This is in a Cooler Master, Master Frame 700 case. We are using some DDR4000 memory provided by Mushkin. And we are using a Noctua NHD15 Pro Max cooler. All of those parts were provided by the companies mentioned. Other stuff, uh, we've got an ASRock Z590M Pro 4 motherboard. Our old test bench was an ASRock Z270. So this is a, a nice, actually I should say our old test bench was a Z170. So this is just same family. Um, Overall, I've been very happy with that board. I have no reason to think that this would be a bad choice here. Maybe not the world's biggest, best Z590 board I could have bought. However, it was available in a nice combo with the 11600K that we're using um, at my local micro center for less than 400 bucks. And although there's a couple of features I would have liked, like Thunderbolt, uh, I can add those with a PCIe card if the time comes. And it has the key feature, which is PCIe Gen 4. Other hardware news, not pocketables this time. Uh, the RTX A2000 was announced this week. And this is very exciting for me, maybe not as exciting for some of you, but the RTX A2000 represents NVIDIA's next Ampere, what used to be Quadro class, they've dropped the Quadro branding, uh, but professional graphics card. The A2000 specifically is a low profile Gen 4x16 GPU uh, that as near as I can tell is a small miracle monster that they crammed it in where they did. Um, so we've got six gigs of ECC GDDR6 at 192 bits. We have 3,328 CUDA cores, 104 tensor cores, and 26 ray tracing cores. Now, if those numbers sound vaguely familiar, that's because those counts aren't all that far off from what the 3060 is equipped with. In fact, it appears to be the same GA106 die, but with a little bit of a shave. Um, and 
super bend. So they've crammed what used to be a 170 watt card in 70 watts. And not all of that was an easy thing to do. Uh, bidding helps a ton. Getting better quality silicon is kind of the cheat that all cards in this class have done. Um, I personally have an RTX 4000, which was the same GPU as the 2070 crammed into a single slot with only 170 watt TDP. And they did that by turning the clocks down. But other than that, I mean, it took a very small clock cut. It was just quality control. GPUs that performed within a certain range went in a Quadro instead of a 2070. Unfortunately for the A2000, to get it entirely slot powered, it did have to take a big hit in the clock speeds. Um, the, the Q to cores, tensor cores, RT cores, that's a small hit, not a big drop. Uh, I want to say it's like 5% there. Where things really hurt is the base clock of the A2000 is only 562 megahertz compared to the 1370 that the 3060 is rated for and with a boost of 1200 not even reaching the base clock of its non-professional brethren. However, for certain applications this is the card. Um, A2000s they're going to have you know pro certified drivers for many display port outs. If you're in a professional scenario where you need to handle four or more because I'm sure they support the daisy chaining that the display port supports uh, high resolution potentially high refresh rate displays the A2000 is the best way to do it especially if you don't need piles and piles and piles of 3d performance along with it uh, great example I run several large projection systems on the previous P2000 series cards and that's what these are a direct replacement for. They're not competing with the 3060 Ti. They're not competing with the 1660 or the 1650. These are competing with the Pascal based P2000 Quadros that never got a touring replacement. So for visualization systems and for some, some of the smaller and more compact workstations, the A2000 is gonna be a given. Honestly, depending on what happens, since it's fully slot powered, if the price is right, I might get one for my little gaming desktop. If anyone remembers when we turned a old workstation into a gaming PC. The key was that it had to fit in that 70 watt envelope. And theoretically, if these are ever affordable, that would be a killer card for a system like that. Uh, next up, Intel had their big architecture day this week. I could have done this whole video on what Intel talked about. A lot of that stuff, probably not interesting to you guys. Lots of news about the new server chips the, that are coming, which are just gonna be monsters. I mean, we're talking four tiles, so they are moving to a non-monolithic approach for the server CPUs. Four tiles worth of gobs of L2 cache, gobs of I.O. We're looking at PCIe Gen 5, DDR5, CXL. I could spend a whole video on that. And if you want me to, let me know and I'll be more than happy to. But I'm just going to kind of gloss over the, the CPU announcement there and say there's a link to some of the SERP, the home articles in the description. More exciting for, well, most people, uh, Intel announced a new technology they're calling XESS, which is, I think, how that's going to be pronounced, just like DLSS, uh, which segues into what it is. This is a Intel implementation of a hardware accelerated upscaling engine similar to NVIDIA's second generation DLSS. And it's going to leverage the new XMX matrix hardware that's in Intel's new ARC GPUs. However, there's one big caveat to that. You 
nothing exists with XMX Matrix hardware yet. So Intel wrote a second version of their new upscaling software that is basically hardware agnostic. It should run on most of your modern GPUs, all the current Intel stuff, potentially Nvidia and AMD as well. And they have announced that they plan to open source the SDK and toolkit in the near future. This is now a three horse race, but one of them hasn't even gotten to the gate yet. So we have DLSS, which we're familiar with, and honestly is fairly good. Uh, I've been playing around with it in No Man's Sky, and I have a hard time telling with it kind of in that middle performance quality mode there what DLSS is actually doing other than improving my frame rate. There's a couple of times where there's something obvious that sticks out, but those are when I stop and look around and actually look to see what DLSS is doing, not when I'm just playing the game and enjoying myself. Um, and I'm also on, you know, like I said, an RTX 4000, which is a 2070, something newer in the, the recent 3000 series cards, I might not even notice as much. I'm using older hardware. AMD has their new, I want to say it's FSR, and I'll correct myself if I'm wrong, uh, upscaling technique. And that's a lot more, or that's a lot closer, I should say, to some of the traditional upscaling methods. But it did have the advantage of, unlike DLSS, potentially being portable to anything. Well, Intel has said, we like DLSS, but we want it to run anywhere, and gone and built their own upscaling with blackjack and hookers. Now, what remains to be seen is how this turns out. Um, this could turn out very similarly to the way FreeSync versus G-Sync has, which was for the longest time, NVIDIA didn't allow you to use a FreeSync panel with an NVIDIA card. Or this could turn into something similar to how uh, things like OBS and FFmpeg accelerate video transcoding, where basically everybody has their own way to do it, but it all works. And it kind of just works across the board as long as you write your code to take advantage of if I have an NVIDIA card, use DLSS. If I have something else, use XESS. Intel is banking on their software being better than AMD's and potentially NVIDIA's while simultaneously being more portable. And although that's a big bet to make, if someone was going to successfully make that gamble, Intel has a very large software team. This is going to be interesting to see how this turns out. One last thing I did want to mention, um, Extra Life. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it. It's a big fundraising charity program. Uh, one of the companies that we've worked with previously, Cooler Master, is sponsoring uh, Sharkins, who's doing a, who did, I should say, a 24-hour charity stream. There should be a record of that available. If not, that'll be up soon but the donations and the giveaways are still running. Um, they were giving away three different PCs, and one of which is still locked. I think they're about $1,000 away. They're collecting donations for Seattle Children's Hospital out on the West Coast, and there'll be a link to the Extra Life information in the description below. If you're curious about that, you know, go enter the, the giveaways if you're so inclined. Go ahead and donate if you're so inclined. Um, that that does go towards unlocking the next PC. It also goes to you know a good cause. Uh, nobody likes kids being sick, so every little bit helps. Um, the third PC that's currently locked, by the way, is a Cooler Master sponsored build. This is in their one of their NR200 cases with a 3070 and a 10700 KF. So. Pretty potent PC. I'm sure everyone will be excited to enter for that if and when it does unlock, which isn't that far away at this point. 
all that said, I want to thank everyone for watching. Um, as always, I want to thank our patrons as well as anyone who helps support Pocketables using our Amazon affiliate links. It is support like that that helps make content like this possible. I also want to thank Electrix for providing our opening closing themes. And finally, thank you for watching.